Good evening, wherever you are. Welcome and thank you for joining us today for IRENA's webinar with invited guests on transforming SEED's power system through variable renewable energy. SEED stands for Small Islands Developing States and we will hear this abbreviation a lot today. So take a note. This is the second and the last edition of the technical webinars and this one focuses on the Caribbean islands. Our first edition, which took place on 29th of October, focused on Pacific Islands and recording and slides are available on IRENA Events website. My name is Martina Lyons and I'm from the IRENA Innovation and Technology Center in Bonn and it is my pleasure to be your host and walk you through today's webinar. Next slide, please. In a moment, I will give you an overview of the webinar, but before doing so, I have a few housekeeping items to cover. So all of you are muted and you will remain so throughout the webinar. Despite that, we would love to hear from you today, during today's presentation. So if you have any questions to our speakers, please send it to us through the question feature that you can find on the webinar panel. We will be monitoring questions throughout the session and select some to be answered by our speakers. Due to time constraints, we apologize in advance if your question is not answered, but we will, however, use all your questions to inform our further discussions. If you experience any technical difficulties, please try to reconnect by dialing in via phone. You can get the number by clicking on the phone option located on the webinar panel, or you can send us a message through chat function and we will try to help you out. Next slide, please. Both slides and recordings will be shared with you uh, following this webinar on IRENA events website and also in our follow-up email in a few days. And last but not least, to be able to reflect on the delivery of our webinar and ways to improve it and also what else you would like us to cover in terms of power sector transformation in a small island developing state, we, we would appreciate your feedback. So at the end of the webinar and then again in the follow-up email, we will share with you a very short satisfactory survey uh, which we invite you to complete. Thank you in advance for doing so. Next slide, please. So the topic arena with their guests brings you today is very relevant. But since our agenda is very packed, I will leave all the talking to our speakers. But before doing so, let me quickly walk you through what to expect today. The agenda for today is as follows. In the moment, I will, we will hear from Roland Roche, IRENA's Innovation and Technology Center Deputy Director, to welcome you all. Up next will be five presentations, three from IRENA, so to set the scene and share key takeaways and insights from the reports applicable to the topic followed by a representative from Antigua, Antigua and Barbuda Public Utility Authority and from the US Department of Energy to share their work and their um, where they see opportunities and, uh, and, and challenges. Uh, we will then hear, uh, we will then have a launch of a new report on quality infrastructure for smart mini grids in Ireland. And hopefully time allows and we will have a short Q&A session where we will ask each speaker one or two questions. And in the closing remark, Roland Roche from IRENA, we will briefly recap and wrap up the webinar with, which, with key takeaways. So without any further ado, next slide please. So without any further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce you to, to Roland Roche, who is a deputy director of the IRENA Innovation and Technology Center. Roland, please, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot for the, the kind introduction. Uh, Martina, um, welcome to everybody who participates here to today, IRENA's technical webinar series on the power sector transformation and small island development states. I'm very happy to, to make the introduction of this very interesting uh, upcoming two hours to discuss uh, the, the specificities of small island development states and how to do the energy sector transformation on islands. First slide, please. So transforming small island development state power systems through variable uh, re renewable uh, energy is, is, is essential. IRENA is since 2012 working and supporting small island development states. Uh, IRENA has uh, 38 uh, member countries from small island development states. And it has been always very important for us to look into the possibilities that we see on, on islands to assess the stability of the grid system and to integrate higher shares of variable renewables on islands. It's a very, let's say there are some very 
much specificities on islands which we would like to discuss in, in detail in this webinar and we would also like to look into the solutions IRENA has been able to provide uh, to IRENA uh, small island development states member countries. Next slide please. I would like, next slide. The IRENA at uh, the International Renewable Energy Agency is a governmental agency with 161 member countries currently but we have another 22 member countries in a session to IRENA, which makes us uh, kind of a almost fully complete global, um, global organization with full global membership. Our mandate is to promote the widespread adoption and sustainable use of all forms of renewable energy worldwide. Um, the objective of IRENA is to serve as a network hub an advisory resource and authoritative unified global voice for renewable energy with the mandate to deploy higher shares of and, and, and to support the deployment of higher shares of variable renewables in IRENA member countries. The scope of our work in the agency is related to all renewable energy sources uh, produced in a sustainable manner and yeah, the, the also enabling the enabling environment to integrate those renewables with, with grids and, and other enabling technologies is part of the work we are doing at IRENA. Next step, next slide. Yes, um, trans, uh, transformation uh, of power system from a predominantly fossil fuel based power system to one with high shares of renewables are supported through technical, institutional and financial feasibility assessments. Technical studies impart recommendations on the technical aspects and reconfirm the visibility uh, of an expansion plan with respect to the operation of the power system. On a very high level of assessment, it helps to address uh, in, in those studies questions such as what new generation are to be incorporated, uh, the geographical location of these generations in the generators in the network, the changes required in the infrastructure and operational practices of the power system, but also depending on the share of variable renewables to be incorporated, um, uh, the visibility of the transformation requir required can be assessed. When the level of variable renewable shares stays between 10 to 15 percent of the instantaneous load, no significant integration issues are expected. But this does not mean that they can be incorporated without any technical assessment of the system. As we know from a lot of island studies we did, very often the island uh, systems are not stable even without uh, renewable energies. So that means to prepare the ground for the integration of higher shares of variable renewables, even for the integration of lower shares, a proper assessment of the existing grid system and infrastructure is needed. Uh, so low to medium penetration of variable renewables can be quantified as to 10 to 30% and high penetration can be considered to extend from around 40 to 100%. In order to understand the challenges in integration that is required to model and simulate the power system and its performance, performance under critical conditions, which is termed as grid assessment study. Based on recommendations from technical studies, the implementation phase can begin. The next slide, please. Next slide, please. Um, so what are the, the specificities here of small island development states? Um, almost all island nations are looking gradually to increase the share of renewables in their power system. Also, IRENA advised, and, and, and it's, it's very, very likable that uh, the most small island development states already have very concrete renewable energy uh, targets, or targets of the renewable energy share. So island grids are usually isolated networks ranging from few hundred kilowatts 
uh, to hundreds of megawatts and they have uh, system specific challenges that they may, may not so be so evident in other larger systems so smaller size of the system makes them prone to stability issues a lot of people may think it's, it's it's more complex to deal with a bigger system but actually the stability of a smaller system is much more critical they are predominantly fossil fuel based on islands making them prone to price volatility um, there is a need on islands on clear policies and roadmaps to promote renewable power generation um, there is a, a need for the strengthening of the technical capacity and know-how that makes uh, them uh, the islands dependent on uh, external organizations for their work. And there are some, some other system specific challenges I would like to, to mention here. Limited resource base uh, depriving them of the benefits of economies of scale. Um, they incur with high costs for energy, infrastructure, transportation, communication, and serving facilities. They are at long distances from export markets and import resources, while uh, usual market prices that people may have in their mind are not applicable. They have fra fragile natural environments that needs to be uh, protected here, so the environmental impact is a key thing. Having growing population, they have uncertainty in demand growth, and more importantly, um, with little resilience, uh, also the resilience to natural disasters, there is a need to develop resilient power systems. Identifying these challenges and to help to address them, uh, the, the publication ARENA uh, has undertaken, and I will pre present it, transforming small island power system from technical planning to studies for the integration of variable renewables. I will briefly mention this, press, this uh, report, this important report, which we brought out in 2019. And a big part of the presentations in this uh, webinar will make reference to this report. Next slide, please. So uh, next slide, please. Irina has uh, already in 2014 started to work with the Island Power Factory, but now we're also cooperating with Siemens on, on, on PSSE, and we're also looking into other tools to model the, the grid stability systems. What you see here is a model of a Dix Island Power Factory. So uh, variable uh, energy generation has inherent challenges and the most challenging uh, of the system operations are their variability, which makes them non-dispatchable, requiring other flexible sources to compensate for their lack of access um, thereof. Their uncertainty or, or their limited predictability impacts the commitment from other generating sources. And then also being non-synchronous and inverter-based, their contribution to the stable system operation is limited. So grid assessment studies address critical questions related to these challenges, such as, and I, I don't want to list all the questions here, but let's say mentioning some, the power system ready to host, is the power system ready to host high shares of renewables, which are the enabling technologies needed to overcome constraints in the systems? And let's say, can all type of renewable resources be used and integrated into the system? And what enabling technologies and what enhancement of enabling technologies is needed? These are the typical questions you can have um, uh, kind of find answers by the study IRENA does but also with the capacity building we undertake to use those uh, models, modeling softwares like um, uh, Power Factory and uh, PSSE. It has been very helpful for the, the island uh, members of IRENA. Please, the next slide. Very briefly, I would like to mention that planning a reliable and efficient power system with high shares of variable renewables 
in small island development states is always a matter of creating uh, trade-offs between reliability of the system and the cost you may have to integrate higher shares of variable renewables and stabilizing the systems. And there, trade-offs are needed between the compliance with physical limits, ensuring sufficient firm capacity in the system, addressing the required flexibility needs, also depending on the supply and demand situation, ensuring system stability is a key thing. So the, the renewable energy sector based re sector transformation in islands works only if the, 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 the system work and the lights uh, will stay on. So ensuring system stability, stability is an integral part of IRENA strategies on island, ensuring effective functioning of protection system and maintaining the right level of power quality is key thing for the renewable energy sector a transformation based on renewables and the integration and coming to high shares of variable renewables. Next slide, please. So the, we have and the, the integration grid, in, in grid integration and grid assessment team has been conducting grid assessments since 2013. So various assessment studies and capacity building activities in the area of grid integration of high shares of variable renewables uh, have, have been uh, delivered. I don't want to mention all of them, so this is a specific webinar for the Caribbean. I mentioned the first study we did in Palau 2013 in the Pacific, but then we did um, um, in Antigua and Barbuda, where a study has assessed the technical feasibility and optimal renewable energy generation that could be included in the system according to the generation expansion plan provided by the operator. The study recommended a share of PV was, um, was high and, and with 30.5 megawatt reaching 83% 80, shares of the demand. Then I would also to mention a very intensive work we did, and we are just at the moment handing over a study to the government in the Dominican Republic. I think since 2014, ARENA has been working together with the Dominican Republic, and uh, we delivered, and we are just in the, at the process of handing over a grid assessment to study the technical constraints uh, to and benefits of implementing the remap analysis or so a potential study that uh, IRENA delivers on the, renew on the existing renewable energy potentials in the Dominican Republic. And we provide a plan how this um, potential can be realized in the grid systems. Next slide. I don't have to, to say much about, um, and let's say that IRENA is extremely uh, active in providing guidance with reports. We just uh, launched a, a publication, Transforming Small Island Power Systems, Technical Planning Studies for the Integration of Variable Renewables. Uh, we will have many references to this study. That's why I don't have to go into the details. The publication highlights the expected challenges in integrating variable renewables on islands, the variable integration planning that is required to support the, the ramping up of higher shares of renewable energy uh, generation. Then the technical studies that are needed to assess the systems and its constraints. And then, of course, the solution required to overcome the specific challenges of islands that I mentioned already, resilience, also scarcity of uh, human capacity to do certain things. and, and plans for capacity building are part of this report. Next slide. I briefly want to mention that IRENA is supporting the enhancement and the implementation of climate action plans. IRENA provides high level technical assistance at country level to support the design, update and implementation of member countries' climate action plans 
in the context of the Paris Agreement. We are hands-on supporting with uh, the climate-related knowledge, data tool, data and tools and products and solution gateways that we also gained over the past years, working closely with our small island development states membership. And we use this, um, this knowledge we have to ensure that sectoral and horizontal strategies are supported towards the enhancement and the revision uh, and or the implementation of the existing climate action plans, uh, including NDCs and then um, also LTS and, and, and national action plans in the context of uh, stabilizing systems more in the context of the climate ch um, change related activities on, under national determined contributions. Next slide, please. I already mentioned here to support the enhancement and implementation of climate action plans in SITS, including NDC, LTS, and NEP uh, and NAPS, uh, National Action Plans, and, and, and long term strategies is key thing. Uh, the technical support for the integration of technology development and transfer in the national climate plans is also supported by the activity the grid assessment team does. So there is an integrated approach to come to higher shares of renewables and also address the national determined contributions of the countries is, is an integral part of IRENA's work in SITS. The last slide, please. Very important, uh, my colleague Francisco Porchel will speak about a report we, we, we just recently, recently launched, Quality Infrastructure for Smart Mini Grids. Uh, let's say many small islands are specifically using uh, mini grids um, in, on these islands. And there are some specific challenges that are addressed in, in, this, in this report that looks into the complexity of the system in com combination with the challenges that exist on four island mini grids and taking these aspects together into account and in how to set up a quality infrastructure for um, um, smart mini grids on islands to make sure that these smart mini grids can properly and sustainable, uh, let's say also long lasting, be operated in islands is part of this report. And let's say what benefits come from quality infrastructure for this smart mini grids will be in detail explained by my colleague Francisco Bochel. Thanks a lot. I would like to hand over uh, back to Martina. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Roland. You kick off with this. Um, with this webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you, Roland. You kick off the webinar with a lot of insights into the power sector transformation with variable renewables in small islands developing uh, states, particularly on their specificities and challenges. And if you identified some opportunities, how to address all that, but you also address uh, how all this falls into NDCs uh, under Paris Agreement. A great introduction into our very packed program today. Thank you. And next is Carlos Tarace, our expert from the Energy Access Team at IRENA. Uh, Carlos will, will also walk us through the SITS Lighthouse Initiative. So if I may uh, invite uh, Carlo. Carlo, over to you. Thank you very much, Martina. Uh, hello to everyone, or good evening to everyone and colleagues. and uh, Welcome, and thank you for joining us in this uh, important webinar. So we can go to the next slide. So the um, so this presentation that I'll be doing, delivering this evening covers the SIDS LHI, the SIDS LHI initiative, uh, SIDS Lighthouses initiative, which is the enabling framework that Arena has and Arena and its partners have to support SIDS in their energy transformation. So next slide, please. So Arena has been focusing a lot on SIDS, uh, energy transformation since its inception and it has sort of doubled its efforts in the last years. Uh, the SIDS LHI, as I mentioned, is this enabling framework that ARENA has in place. 
Uh, it has 36 seats that are partners of uh, that are partners and uh, 30 seats, sorry, and 30 and 30 development partners, so countries and partner organizations. And through this enabling framework, uh, IRENA and its partners address aspects related to policy, regulatory and technical advisory services, and uh, market frameworks. So in addition to technology options, we look at uh, capacity building, policy makers, uh, uh, utilities regulators, and financing institutions. Uh, we also support our member countries in uh, project facilitation, uh, making bankable project proposals, and uh, helping them access affordable finance, which has come out as uh, one of the main issues regarding SEEDS in, the, uh, in these past years. Uh, we also host a knowledge sharing platform where we disseminate information, best practices, and lessons learned, and where we also host webinars such as uh, this one. So next slide, please. So the SEEDS Lighthouse Initiative has 12 priority areas of action, uh, which we identified with our partners. I uh, will expand on a few of them, not all of them, but uh, for example, very important, we're now looking at supporting countries in their NDC enhancement and implementation. Um, in the Caribbean, for example, we're working with various countries such as St. Kitts and Nevis, the Dominican Republic, or Grenada, for example, um, but there are more. Uh, we are looking at all sources of renewable energy, uh, and we're strengthening human capacity through all throughout the whole uh, renewable energy value chain. Um, Another important thing is that we're also looking at end use sectors. Uh, so transport, for example, uh, and there's the case where we, we, we're developing, a, we have developed our uh, roadmap on uh, transport for Antigua and Barbuda. And we're also focusing on the nexus. So the cr crucial nexus between energy, health, agriculture, and water. Uh, next slide, please. So as, as you can see on the slide, so we are now, uh, we have now achieved, uh, we've now reached uh, throughout all seeds, uh, 3.46 uh, gigawatts. Uh, so this is close to the Seeds Lighthouses initiative target of five gigawatts by 2023. Uh, by technology, hydro has been, uh, remained pretty constant, but there's also been a wide uptake of solar and there's also been a high shift onto wind uh, as well as bioenergy. Uh, next slide, please. So if we look at the Caribbean region in particular, we're now sitting at uh, 2.4 uh, gigawatts installed capacity, capacity, which is quite equally divided between hydro, bioenergy, solar, and wind. And we can go to the next slide. So one of our main areas um, is in strengthening partnerships and capacity on the ground and to strengthen dialogue between partners and seeds, uh, to exchange lessons learned, the best practices uh, and all that. So this is a, a snapshot of what we have done in the past seven months. Um, very importantly, we have had, we've held two uh, ministerial meetings where we looked at policy issues. Uh, we met with policymakers. And we had trainings as well with regulators and utilities for the development of bankable uh, 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 PPAs. And we have trained financing institutions in developing these projects as well. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, once, uh, so I guess we can start to address the many concrete ways in which ARENA through the CS Lighthouses Initiative helps seeds in transforming their energy sectors. So as mentioned before, NDC support is among our key priorities at the moment. Uh, this is just an example of a snapshot of the countries we've been supporting or we're beginning to support in the Caribbean region. Uh, some examples are in Guyana, St. Kitts and Nevis, St. Vincent and Grenadine, Dominica, Grenada, Dominican Republic or Belize. And our activities are wide ranging. So they go from monitoring report and verification to e-mobility roadmaps and uh, deployment of renewable energy in end use sectors. Uh, next slide, please. So here's a, a, a snapshot, I would say, yes, of the tools and services that IRENA provides and that SEEDS can access through the SEEDS Lighthouses Initiative. So, of course, Roland has touched in detail on the grid integration analysis, uh, but we can uh, provide a quick overview of the other services that we provide. So uh, quick, we undertook quick scans in uh, nine Caribbean countries where we see what the issues are, what we, and we try to map out uh, solutions. 
Uh, we have also developed uh, renewable energy roadmaps. These look at sort of long-term technical and financial solutions, but also look at the human capacity that is needed to meet national NDC targets. And we undertake we undertook renewable and uh, renewable readiness assessments at the national level, such as in Antigua and Barbuda, Grenada, or Barbados. But we're also looking, so we look at the general energy sector for these renewable readiness assessments, but we also undertake uh, sectoral uh, raise, or we're beginning to do that. So, for example, now in the face of COVID-19, we're starting to look at the health energy nexus as well as food and water, as mentioned before. Uh, next slide, please. So, uh, as I mentioned previously, we have this uh, knowledge hub and dissemination uh that can be accessed through our website so here you can find all the information that citizen partners need to support seeds in their energy transformation uh there are also some there are also project facilitation tools that arena provides uh for example our global atlas looks at resource assessment uh we do solar rooftop simulation uh, as well on the global atlas uh, there's a project navigator which supports the bankability of projects uh, that was later fed into the climate uh, uh, initiative uh, investment platform. And we also have the open solar contracts, which is a joint initiative between ARENA and the Terawatt initiative, uh, where we have come up with various contracts ranging from operations, maintenance, financing, looking at the PPAs of uh, renewable uh, energy projects. And finally, we have the ARENA IDFD facility, which supports projects on the ground. So particularly in the Caribbean, uh, we have projects in Antigua and Barbuda for the resilience uh, of a local hybrid solar and wind project against major hurricanes and storms. Or in Cuba, for example, where we're funding uh, four solar plants with battery storage systems. But there are many other projects. These are just a, a few examples. Uh, next slide, please. So, as I mentioned, access to finance has been uh, consistently highlighted as a major challenge in uh, the high-level dialogues that we have uh, organized these past seven months. Uh, so, IRENA has already been working with, this, with the Caribbean region in this regard, uh, as I mentioned, and on uh, projects that total sort of plant capacity of around 880 megawatts across multiple renewable energy technologies. Um, so these projects represent an investment volume of around 200 uh, million dollar, US dollars. And the support is currently carried out, uh, among other things, through the Climate Investment Platform, which is a joint initiative of IRENA, the UNDP, uh, Sustainable Energy for All, in cooperation with the Green Climate Fund. So through CIP, IRENA aims to support our members uh, on the ground in boosting investments, in renewable energy projects and facilitating access to finance by provi and providing the risking solutions. And it is operationalized through the investment forums. So we're looking to organize one in the Caribbean and we will also have other investment forums for other SIDS regions. Uh, next slide, please. And so finally, this slide highlights some of the issues that still need to be addressed. And so these are some of the messages that have come out of our high-level meetings. Uh, as mentioned, as I mentioned, we had joint high-level ministerials with EOSIS and a follow-up meeting organized with Denmark. So even though a lot has been done, there is more, and we still need to work more on seeds uh, with seeds in their energy transformation. Uh, in particular, however, uh, Caribbean seeds have addressed a number of issues. So these go from the revision of ODA eligibility rules so that they can access more easily funding from international financing institutions. Uh, they've highlighted that they need urgent support for particular sectors such as tourism and water, which were ravaged particularly by the ongoing pandemic. And they, as well as their need to green their transport sector, for example, which accounts for roughly 30 to 40% of all imports in the Caribbean region. So, but here you can see the messages. Um, so next slide, uh, the concluding slide, please. Okay, here. So as a conclusion, I, you know, we, we would like to acknowledge uh, some of the partners that have been supporting us. Uh, we have Denmark, France, Japan, the UAE, but also Belgium, New Zealand, or Norway, but also the NDC partnership with UNDP, which are not on the slide, but are very important to mention. So 
thank you all for your support and we look forward to continuing cooperating with you and with them to support cities in their energy transformation so you can access uh, so i will end on this note here and uh, more information can be accessed on the website and you can also email us so back to you martina Thank you, Carlo, for sharing with us many, many activities you are pursuing with member countries and with partners under this uh, Lighthouse uh, Initiative umbrella. And thank you for setting the scenes for today's, uh, today's other presentation and discussions. Again, thank you very much. And now let's move to our next speaker. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce you to Andre Matais, who is an electricity business unit manager at the Antigua Public, uh, Public Utilities Authority. Uh, but before I hand it over to Andre, please don't forget to use question feature on your panel to ask questions to our speaker, speakers. And now, Andre, over to you. Thank you very much, Martina. Um, let me say special thanks to Irina for um, inviting EPUA to be part of this discussion. Here in Antigua, another government um, wants to integrate as much renewable energy into the grid as is feasible, um, considering all the technical constraints. Um, let me first speak on the, the, the grid, the characteristics of the grid in Antigua and Barbuda. Next slide, please. Next slide. Okay, in Antigua, we have, a, in terms of the installed capacity at APUA, we have a 27 megawatt um, power plant. It was recently owned by an IPP, but has been turned over to APUA. It's all diesel HFO engines. Um, the IPP presently owns a 50 megawatt plant, um, 17 mega install in 2007, and another three 11 megawatt install in 2010. These are all um, HFO units. We also have quite a significant amount of solar, considering the, the size of Antigua's grid. Um, we presently have a three megawatt solar plant close to the airport. We have a four megawatt solar plant. We're going to be installing a 1.7 megawatt um, at the Cricket Stadium in Antigua. And we have quite a bit of rooftops. We have a very aggressive interconnection policy. Um, through the efforts of the Department of Environment, there's going to be a four megawatt wind plant installed. Next slide, please. The peak demand in Antigua as of 2019 was 57 megawatt. We know what the COVID has done to the world, and Antigua is no exception. Um, we've seen the peak reduced to as low as, as um, 45 megawatt, but um, it's slowly returning back to the pre-COVID peak. We have, in the, on the weekends, we have a, a day peak of 45 meg megawatt. But in the industry, in the utility, we, we follow N minus two planning margin, which requires you to have enough generation to cover your peak load plus your two largest set, gen sets. Now, the rationale behind that is that you must have enough generation that if you're doing plan maintenance on one of your bigger sets, and then another set um, needs to have emergency maintenance, you still must be able to serve the connected load. So our peak load I mentioned was 57. We have 77 megawatt of firm capacity. So we're presently short of eight megawatt. Um, and that is really to take care of um, the reserve capacity. Now, the government has a very aggressive housing program, which means that the load is going to be increasing in a, at a very rapid rate. There are also some improvement that's going to be make, taking place in the hotel industry. Some of the hotels are having expansion. The, the port, the island's port, doing a major expansion. So we still need for additional generation immediately. And it's not so much to take care of energy, but to, to really um, look at the demand situation, as I mentioned in the N minus two plan imagine. So we're presently um, trying to install a 40 megawatt LNG power plant. Why LNG? Um, well, first we thought of solar and wind, the batch combination. But for the purpose in which we need the generation, it's mainly demand, firm, dispatchable demand we, we're requiring right now. We, we definitely look for the, the cleanest form of fossil, fossil fuel. And um, also LNG power plant we know can respond to frequency variation um, quite a bit. Next slide, please.
energy versus demand. In Antigua, we don't have a, presently don't have a, a major issue with energy, having enough generation to supply the energy needs of the country. What we have, as I just mentioned, is a demand issue where, in fact, just recently we had to be shedding load because two of the major sets were off on maintenance. So we had to be shedding load. So you need that with reserve capacity to, to um, prevent the, the utility from shedding load. Um, when we look at last year and last set of maybe the last couple of years, the, the gensets at the at the power plants, they have they have distributed energy much less than the, the capacity of the plant, somewhere in the region of 50%, 60%. So it means that there's a lot of energy that can be distributed at the plant, but what we have is a demand issue. Next, next slide, please. And Barbuda, we would not want to forget Barbuda, our sister island, very small, only a peak demand of 350 kilowatt. We have quite a bit of generation capacity, um, 2,000 or 2, 2 megawatt, all diesel. Um, but through efforts and um, with assistance from the UAE, we are going to be um, relocating the power plant in Barbuda, where it's presently located. Anytime there's a storm, you have water ingress um, into the power plant. So we will put it at a more resilient and secure area. Um, also, we'll be adding 720 kilowatt of solar and 863 kilowatt of batteries. You might wonder why we're going with two diesel sets. Um, yes, because we recognize that in the night when the sun doesn't shine, there is a need, unless we're gonna increase the battery amount, which is presently costly. I mean, if we wanna cover the battery for the entire night period, that would be quite costly. Um, so basically we have two diesel generators with sophisticated controls. And so we're able in Barbuda to have a green solution in the day, but in the night um, you will have to use the gensets. The system is designed to be very modular so we can add um, PV systems later on, we can add battery system later. And um, we have incorporated all of the issues that um, was mentioned before by Roland in terms of um, technical issues, we have ensured that we, we have a, a well-designed system in Barbuda, the new system. Next slide, please. The TND network, just quickly in Antigua, we have a, a ring, 69 kV ring system. It's small, but very co complex. And um, I think Roland mentioned that before, that even though we're very small, it's very complex. Um, you have seven substations, quite a bit of distribution feeders. In Barbuda, very small, only two, two distribution feeders, one substation. Substation is effectively the power station. Um, and most of the system is, 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 um, is, is overhead. In fact, there's a project where we put in a great deal of Barbuda electricity network underground for resiliency measures. Next slide, please. So let me go to the study that was conducted by IRENA. Um, in 2014, leading up to 2015, um, the government started discussion, um, trying to have more RE, and VRE in particular, variable renewable energy onto the grid. The, I know a Department of Environment, we're looking at wind plants. Um, we were looking, along with the Ministry of Energy, looking at um, solar, solar system. So we engaged IRENA to, look at the system, look at the characteristics of our power system, and just see how much renewable can be integrated into the system without any major technical issues. Um, the criteria that I really used in the study, they wanted to ensure that the frequency exertion, um, excursion, sorry, shall not lead to system collapse. That is very crucial. And they were looking at um, a 10 minute fluctuation in VRE. Um, now, that is more, more towards the stability and steady state. Um, they, they didn't look so much on the transient side. Transient, you look fractions of a second. The dynamic, you more look at the seconds and steady states, more minutes. Next slide, please. So, what is the result of the study that was done by Irina? I mean, uh, recognize various challenges with, with the grid in Antigua. 
um, and this is coming straight from the report, I mean, I would have indicated that there will be increased risk of voltage and frequency collapse after contingency. Contingencies are if we lose a major line, if you lose a major generator. Um, now, we know that our system does not, does, does not normally um, provide the same amount of vast support than the traditional fossil fuel. Um, so I really recommended that all VRE generation shall have voltage control capabilities. And that is something that we have insisted that any new RE system comes online must have that. They also recommended that all utility scale VRE generation shall support network due disturbance. Now, this is very crucial because when there's a fault on the grid, you don't want the RE system to be coming off of the grid. You want it to support the, the fault current, meaning you need a, a high fault current in order for the protective devices to operate. So if the RE is going to come off of the grid or isolated from the grid, and then the fault current reduces, it means the fault stays on the grid in a longer, a longer time. So that recommendation is welcome. Um, also, distributed PV generation shall be installed proportional to feeder consumption, meaning that on each feeder, you don't want to have excesses, um, excessive RE. So it does affect the stability of that feeder and poor quality. And also, they recommended the protection settings of the VRE generation shall be consistent with the existing mm -hmm. diesel plants, meaning they must be the same. Um, next slide, please. Another um, concern and, uh, that Irene had with, with the grid, um, they've in, uh, indicated that increased risk of load disconnection in case of a sudden loss of generation due to reduced inertia. Now, we know that the, the fossil fuel plants offer a lot more inertia to the system. And inertia, high inertia means more stability. So you, you, you basically want a situation that when the, the generators, the fossil fuels are off, you will have enough inertia on the system to maintain stability. Recommendation from Irina is to up, update the current procedure to allocate spinning reserves so that the loss of the largest unit, you don't have a major issue. Now, there's a limitation as to how much spinning reserve that you can have on the grid. I mean, we have our biggest gen set is 17 megawatt. Ideally, you'd want to have 17 megawatt of spinning reserve, but that is not um, practical and it's not the most economical way of doing business either. And another thing, you cannot guarantee that even if you have that amount of spinning reserve, when you lose a gen set, um, you're not going to have um, on the frequency load shedding. Next slide, please. The results of the study, um, Irina, the, the results indicated that uh, the integration of VRE generation will tend to impact diesel operation. Now, this is very crucial because VRE, as the name um, implies, you have the sun shines and then you know there's a cloud cover. It means that the output from the VRE source varies. Now, in a, in a power system, you have to maintain a, a certain frequency. In Antigua, it's 60 hertz. So it means if you lose generation from the VRE, you have to have generation from the fossil fuel plant. Or if that is not immediately available, then you have to have load shedding. So now we purchase power, most of the power from an IPP. Now, if you have these power plants um, oscillating, trying to adjust to keep a 60 hertz frequency, you, that affects cost. I mean, that affects the IPP bottom line. So we have to have discussions with the IPP. The contracts you sign with the IPP, we have to honor that. So we're in discussions presently with the IPP. Irina recommended um, APA to investigate potential conflict with, relating to contracts with the IPP, which I just said we're doing. Also, APA should discuss with the diesel manufacturers for um, limitation on the plants, and we have done that. Next slide, please. Irina, in the study also, there was insufficient measurement from solar resources. What um, we did not have irradiation um, um, data, so they had to use data from neighboring island. I think it's in the Virgin Islands. Um, so they're recommending that we start to do some measurement. Also, um, 
the study, the model that was prepared by IWENA, um, some of the information from the gensets um, were generic um, data, like the governor control system, the AVR system, as a voltage um, regulator system, they were more generic. Um, what we would need to do in the future as we up upgrade these studies is to provide the exact information so that the, the model could represent, you know, what it is in the field. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Yes, another issue that um, that was 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 encountered during the study period is the increased complexity for definition and implementation. Previous slide, please. We go back to the previous slide. Back, back, not, not forward, sorry. Okay, yes. Um, okay, so basically what we're doing in terms of the implementation of the study that Irina did, um, because we took that study very seriously and, um, oh, sorry, you're back there now. So that complexity for the definition of um, unit commitment it is I, I really recommended um, to implement an automatic and centralized system um, to perform unit commitment and generation dispatch. Now we know that we 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 purchase power from the IPP. Um, what happens sometimes is that we have a, a energy contract per se. So towards the towards the end of the year, we have to meet a, a minimum guaranteed amount of energy. So at times you're, you're forced to put all the sets on at a particular plant. Now that might not necessarily be the schedule that you would want to meet the technical concerns, but you might have to do that to meet financial concerns. So you always have to, to weigh the technical issues versus the financial issues. Next slide, please. And so what has APUA done? Next slide, please. What has APUA done in terms of implementing the IWINA study? Thanks. Um, we have a, an interconnection policy I mentioned before. It's quite aggressive. Um, we, we have basically ensured that 15%, only 15% of, of, the, um, of, the, of renewable will go on any feeder. And that is to ensure that we don't have situations with um, with, with poor quality um, issues on, on any system. We have also um, ensured that any new generation that we have, uh, I speak of the, 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 the LNG plant, we ensure that you know we have in plan green, first of all, as green as we can go, obviously. I mean, LNG is not, not green, but is one of the greenest source of, of fossil fuel. And, um, and the controls, we ensure that the controls are flexible enough so that we can adjust, the plant can adjust to the varying frequency as a result of the VRE. Also, we are, we are discussing with that new contract, um, we are ensuring that basically we don't have an, an energy contract, okay? Because we want to leave energy for renewable energy sources. So that contract would be uh, more as a demand contract. Once they can maintain a certain demand, you know, we pay for that demand. And then obviously once energy is produced, we pay for the energy. So those are some of the things that, that we're doing. We uh, have also negotiated to purchase some uh, uh, support. We will be, we have also decided to um, purchase batteries for grid, grid stability purposes. Um, basically, we know that you know the, the grid is, is not as stable, or small grid not as stable as the bigger grids in the UK, which we have interconnection between the different countries. So we have batteries to stabilize the grid. So in the in the situation in Barbuda, that I did mention what we're doing to incorporate some of the recommendations from Irina with that new plant. Some study, technical studies that we see that will have to be done. 
Um, we have presently done some load flow and short static studies without the VRE, but we now have to incorporate the VRE into these studies. Last year, we, we, we completed a comprehensive protection coordination study. Um, again, that was without the VRE. We now have to incorporate the VRE. And importantly, we have to and maybe engage IRENA to do some transient and frequency stability analysis. That is very crucial because we don't not we, we need to look at uh, fractions of a second. We have seen with our experience that a solar system can move from three megawatt to 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 zero megawatt, close to zero megawatt within fraction of a second. So we need to study the dynamics of the system at that at that point. And um, grid code, this is very crucial. We need to, 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 to engage consultants to look at the grid code. The grid code basically dictates what amount of RE, how it can be allowed in a system based on the characteristic of the system. It, it speaks to the protection setting, speaks to stability. It's a more comprehensive way of looking at it. Next slide, please. And, and just finally, um, there's some issues that we will, will definitely need to look at as we, we consider the technical situation. Um, the resiliency issues, um, Roland in his first presentation uh, mentioned that, but um, we know that that resiliency, I mean, solar panels, they are exposed to the elements of the weather. And, um, you know, we're looking at making them more secure. Um, we know rooftops, they're on roofs, and you know, we we are right in the hurricane belt. And um, usually it's the roof that we lose, first of all. So we have to ensure that they're, they're, they're well secured. And uh, one of the biggest challenges is insurance. We have two solar plants ground mounted that are presently not insured because um, insurance coverage is becoming more difficult for these um, high risk um, high risk assets. So with that, um, I, I would again um, thank Irina and I await questions a little later. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andre, for sharing with us the energy situation in Antigua and Barbuda and, and the technical aspects of all these like challenges and solutions to integrate renewables into the power grid, but also reflecting on Irina's study and recommendation. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is uh, Ms. Gayatri Nair, IRENA expert on power grid integration. Gayatri will share with you key takeaways from IRENA's report, Transforming Small Islands Technical Study Planning Studies for the Integration of Variable Renewables. Gayatri, over to you. Thank you, Martina. Um, so, uh, can I have the next slide, please? So, good afternoon to all of you and thank you for joining us today. Uh, like Martina mentioned, I will be uh, discussing some of key takeaways from the publication, Irina, um, Irina's publication, uh, Transforming Small Islands, Technical Planning Studies for the Integration of VRE. And I will be discussing basically on what is discussed in detail in the uh, publication, inside the publications. So this was a document which was intended as a, a guide to power system operators of small islands who are actually looking in the into the process of uh, integrating high shares of renewables into their system, especially uh, variable renewables. And they face the challenges of conducting and analyzing uh, system, uh, their system's uh, preparedness to accept uh, the sh high shares of VRE. Uh, this document is freely available on our website and you can download it from there. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, before uh, planning to integrate high shares of uh, renewables and especially VRE, system operators and stakeholders must understand the characteristics of uh, VRE and its impact on system operation. I think uh, the speakers before me have um, explained quite a few of them, but I would just like to highlight the main challenges or the challenge creating um, uh, characteristics of VRE, like the fact that they are uh, non-synchronous in nature because they are interfaced with the grid through uh, power electronic uh, devices. So they, they, are, they decouple from the grid, uh, from the frequency and voltage of the system, and therefore it causes the system to behave differently as compared to a, a system with high shares of conventional generation, uh, especially under network events. And then they are location constrained because of the availability of um, the renewable resources are not everywhere. So they have to be placed at 
uh, locations where the resources are highly available. And uh, this might cause or require uh, significant network extensions or otherwise lead to network conditions. Also, uh, they can be deployed at very uh, small scale in distribution grids. Uh, these distribution grids are not actually def defined or designed for this kind of power flow. And uh, as Roland mentioned earlier, they are uncertain because of their limited predictability. So there is uh, always a chance of an unex unexpected change in the power generation uh, compared to forecasted values. And they are variable also because that is something inherent in both solar as well as wind. And that's the expected change in power output uh, because of the variation in the primary uh, resource like solar irradiation or wind speed. But all of this has got specific impacts on the, uh, the power system operation and power system um, uh, characteristics as such. Like uh, the power system operator with high shares of VRE must ensure sufficient firm capacity. And uh, that is to have, uh, gen that's also defined as generation adequacy. So that uh, to ensure that the generation fleet will still be able to reliably supply the electrical load at all times. Uh, they also must look into addressing the flexibility needs. Uh, that means to accommodate the intraday variations, what kind of uh, net load the, the, the other generation fleet should cater for. Uh, this is again driven by mostly the variability and uncertainty of VRE. They also must be very specific, like Mr. Uh, Matthias mentioned, about the stability of the system, which is a major technical concern when integrating high shares of VRE in the power system. Uh, also, the compliance of the physical limits of the system, like the thermal capacity of lines, transformers, and other uh, network uh, elements. So, uh, because, like I mentioned before, uh, some of the grids are not designed for reverse power flows or back flows. So, everything that um, uh, the system is involved in uh, accepting the power generation from VRE should be reviewed. Uh, another uh, thing, like I mentioned now, another uh, very crucial um, uh, aspect is the effective functioning of protection systems because um, the, the VRE, because it's connected through power electronic devices, it doesn't contribute to the short circuit current. And then because of which the, there is a, uh, the protection systems don't function, effectively so there is need for reviewing the protection system system settings next slide please so first step uh, when conducting technical studies to plan for the integration of vre is to acquire a previous slide previous slide please it's a previous slide yeah uh, i'm not sure i think there's a slide missing essential steps in planning to overcome challenges So uh, the first step, uh, can we go to the next slide? Uh, I think there is a, a slide missing, I'm not, I'm not sure, but I'll just uh, tell you what it actually may, uh, contain, contains. So it's basically first step when conducting technical studies to plan for the integration of VRE is to acquire a good understanding of the characteristics of the power system being studied. So uh, one has to have uh, an understanding about the flexibility of existing and future power generation fleets. Uh, what is the demand and the load profile existing in the uh, system? So if there is a correlation between the system load and the expected VRE generation, so it allows you to ascertain what kind of generation is needed from the other, um, other generating sources, which are non-VRE. Also the structure and the strength of transmission and distribution networks uh, must be uh, analyzed because that is what limits the hosting capacity of the system to existing uh, to the new VRE. This should be followed uh, by VRE implementation strategy, uh, which is in both long term as well as short term, um, which allows to uh, identify future expansion investment and uh, optimal generation schedule for an upcoming operation period. Uh, another point that must be looked into is the operational and planning practices that exist in the system. So what kind of, uh, is, is there an absence of uh, dedicated or long mid long-term uh, planning um, uh, plans or implementation strategies, then we should take steps to uh, kind of bring that or put into place such strategies. Uh, is there an absence of sufficient uh, operating reserves and what can be done to overcome that? And in, is there an in inadequacy of uh, uh, load shedding schemes? Is there a, a review required of those schemes? Uh, is the, uh, the operation of diesel power plants automated and do they consider the new VRE generation? And do you have upgrades, um, I mean, grid codes? And if, if you have, do have it upgraded into including the operation conditions for uh, VRE. The last point to be considered is the influence of governance on technical operation and the organization of the electric, electricity sector. 
So are they vertically integrated? Is there a lot of vertical integration with a lot of um, independent power producers? And uh, is there some extent of vertical and horizontal unbundling? Is there a power market existing in the system? And uh, so most of the sites identify themselves with the first category or the second category. So all of these factors influence how much VRE integration can be done in an island power system. Uh, and to go, go to this uh, current slide being shown, uh, the different studies that are needed uh, to be conducted before integrating them are shown here. And the they publication actually describes them in the time horizon for these studies and also whether they should be done in the expansion planning or the, um, the operation planning scenarios and how, how much or how much of these studies recommendations are applicable to small island developing states. So they actually help system operators to foresee any technical issues that may arise in the integration of VRE. Uh, this figure is a representation of uh, what degrees of limitation can arise from different studies. And to highlight here, the system stability itself is one of the major limiting factors for uh, integration of VRE. Next slide, please. So uh, the network studies that um, I think Mr. Um, Matthias has already uh, mentioned quite a few of them, but these are detailed network studies that are required before you consider implementing VRE into the system. And uh, the publication discusses each of these detail, each of these studies in great detail. Uh, so the static network studies, um, which comprise of load flow studies, short circuit studies, and static security assessments, system stability studies, which consider uh, frequency stability, transient stability, and uh, voltage stability. Uh, also special network studies, which is actually comprising of grid compliance studies and grid impact studies, and also defense plans, which is the protection setting studies. I'm not going into a great detail on this because it is given in very much detail in, in the publication. So uh, next, next slide, please. So uh, what one point that I would like to highlight about this publication is that um, each of the solutions or each of the uh, studies which recommend solutions, they do so in different time frames. Like for uh, load flow and static security assessment, you can see that the solution which is recommended for expansion planning is not the same as the solution recommended for operation planning. Of course, uh, any system operator would know this, but this is just to highlight that this, is, uh, the, the, this particular publication goes into so much of detail. So in case of... Planning, the recommendation would say generation rescheduling is needed, including VRE curtailment. The same thing is applicable for short circuit studies. Um, uh, the same thing is applicable for short circuit studies. In case of um, expansion planning, uh, the uh, it would recommend to de determine possible upgrades for existing equipment and in case of operational planning the recommendation would be for network switching or changing the network uh, topology and review the protection coordination next slide please uh, moving forward the same uh, analysis or the same uh, reductions apply for system stability studies in case of transient stability uh, and under expansion planning, uh, we would the, the, the guide would recommend that it is necessary to assess the adequacy of the planned network structure, whereas under operational planning, generation redispatch and VRE curtailment and modification of uh, voltage set points of the generating units can be uh, done. For uh, frequency stability, which is of great importance to most of the system operators, expansion planning would uh, recommend measures that, that might include uh, synthetic inertia function for VRE power plants, automatic generation control scheme, improving UFLS settings or um, and deployment of energy storage. But in case of operational planning, it would be generation redispatch and improvement of uh, under frequency load shedding settings. And in case of voltage stability, it would, it would mean expansion planning. It would be to um, new investment, consider new investment in reactive power compensation um, devices. Whereas in case of operational planning, it would be to review the settings of the uh, reaction, uh, reactive power decompensation schemes which are already implemented. So next slide, please. Next slide. Here uh, in this slide, uh, on the right, you can see the list of studies discussed in detail in the publication. So, and for each of these studies, uh, the, it highlights, the publication highlights the data required, the evaluation criteria for each study, how the study should be performed and how to analyze the results from the study. The list of uh, solutions applicable at expansion planning and operational planning stages, the workflow to perform the study and 
uh, examples of similar studies and reference for further reading are also provided. So in addition, the study provides indications on the applicability of each of these studies and solutions for SIDS. So like uh, most of the speakers before have mentioned, uh, solutions that are uh, recommended for integrate um, in um, interconnected systems are not necessarily applicable for small island uh, systems. So the uh, the document actually makes a clear distinction of this. So in this slide, you can also see the uh, rec some of the solutions which have been recommended under infrastructure investment. So there is a grading to given to each of these solutions, uh, like um, from low, medium to high, uh, to grade them according to their applicability to small island developing uh, power systems. Uh, say, for example, uh, I can just say the first one, diversification of uh, VRE installations, something which is highly applicable in an interconnected power system because of the geographic, geographical dispersity of uh, variable resources available. But in case of island power systems, they may not have a high applicability, but low applicability. But in case of uh, flexible thermal generation in small islands, because most of the uh, existing generation fleet comprises of diesel generation, and it has high ramping capabilities. So this electric storage again here there is medium to high applicability depending on what type of storage is recommended. So battery has high applicability, whereas in case of um, pump storage, it would have very low applicability. So similarly for um, distribution automation, so it has a low to medium applicability because it is relatively a very sophisticated technology. And if there is a means to invest in such a sophisticated technology, then it has high applicability. So um, interconnection with neighboring systems have very low applicability because it is not possible for isolated systems to interconnect with neighboring islands or neighboring uh, countries. It's very rarely possible. It's not impossible, but it's very rarely possible. And therefore, uh, this is how the solutions have been graded. Can you move to the next slide, please? Under operational um, measures, some of the solutions that have been given are like demand uh, response programs. Uh, so this has medium applicability because uh, there is uh, an option to leverage the fact that there are a lot of significant customers uh, who have backup diesel generation at their uh, houses and they can be incorporated into the system to provide demand response program. So that is why it has got a medium applicability. Then uh, adaptive generation dispatch and control has high cost, high applicability because of the relative uh, low cost and ease of implementation. And it has a lot of synergies with other solutions like uh, VRE forecast, uh, then having smart transmission grids and uh, automatic power controller, network monitoring, etc. Then similarly, accurate VRE forecast. It has got medium applicability because Weather forecasts in small islands are considered to be less accurate than um, you know, over larger areas. So usually uh, this can be incorporated as a module within energy management uh, tools or distribution management tools. And, depending, and it depends on the availability of a reliable uh, weather forecast service. Automatic uh, power controller and network monitoring also has medium applicability for SIDS, which is uh, generally having low complexity, requiring less sophisticated monitoring and control than large systems and it has synergies with most of the other solutions uh, recommended. So with this, I come to the conclusion of my uh, presentation and thank you all for listening in. Thank you, Gayatri, for your insightful presentation and sharing with us key takeaways on the process and some of the solution from the report. A lot was covered and very encouraging and we will hear later on on some practical aspects of it. Thank you. And now it is my pleasure to introduce you to our next speaker, Ms. Jennifer De Cesaro, who will share with us the work of the United States Department of Energy under the Energy Transition Initiative. Jennifer, over to you. Great. Thank you, Martina. Uh, if you can go to the next slide, please. And the next slide again. Great. Uh, well, first, um, Good day to everyone. Uh, I'm thrilled to be here and be part of uh, IRENA's technical webinar series and to be able to share with all of you um, some of the work that we have been doing under DOE's Energy Transitions Initiative. I'm just going to give a little bit of background about ETI before um, getting into some of the details. Um, Roland's presentation at, at the beginning and, and every presenter uh, throughout the last hour uh, have really touched on 
a number of the reasons uh, why uh, the Department of Energy uh, started the Energy Transitions Initiative. Um, this is a program that grew out of work that started back in the 2008 timeframe. Um, as I'm sure many people can remember, oil prices spiked significantly uh, and had a huge impact on the energy systems in uh, many, many islands and remote communities uh, throughout the world. Um, at that time, the state of Hawaii and the U.S. launched a very aggressive clean energy initiative. And also at that same time, uh, the United States, uh, New Zealand, and Iceland started a uh, joint program called Energy Development and Island Nations. Uh, and through that program, DOE uh, worked with the U.S. Virgin Islands. Um, so our work with the U.S. Virgin Islands and Hawaii um, served as the foundation and the platform for our energy transitions initiative. So ETI is focused on advancing self-reliant island and remote communities through resilient energy systems. But we approach that work in a way that uh, looks at you know, how we can actually focus more on local resource reliance. So rather than you know, continuing to import fuel for the energy sector from outside, how can uh, we assist islands in actually um, developing their local resources, such as solar and wind and others? Um, looking at, you know, we've been talking a lot uh, today about the resilience of the physical system itself, but, you know, as we increase the physical system resilience, we also have the ability and the need to increase institutional and social resilience. Uh, as well. Um, we're also focused on uh, looking at lower costs and cost predictability uh, and looking at developing replicable approaches. So we know it's not a one size fits all. Every system is, is different and unique. But if we can look at kind of approaches uh, that can be used in a broader set of, of jurisdictions, then that's beneficial. Um, if you can go to the next slide, please. So over the next couple of slides, I'm going to talk about some of the work that we've been doing with the U.S. Virgin Islands more recently. I know that at the beginning, we have been working with the Virgin Islands um, for about 12 years now, but um, in as Many of many countries in the region in 2017 were impacted by hurricanes Irma and Maria. Um, we are working very closely with both the U.S. Virgin Islands and Puerto Rico on their long-term energy recovery efforts following those two devastating storms. Um, one thing that I would like to, to note is that the work that we had been doing with the USDI through the Energy Transitions Initiative really allowed for the utility and the government to really know what to do in the, in the aftermath of the storms as they uh, started preparing their plan for, for the recovery of the energy sector. Um, so I'm going to talk a, a bit about a couple of the um, um, efforts that we have going on with the Virgin Islands right now. So from a, a kind of policy perspective, uh, the Virgin Islands had had a net energy metering program um, that was established uh, in like the 2013 timeframe, but it had capacity caps associated with it uh, for the two uh, systems. Uh, so there's a, one grid for the island of St. Croix, and then the islands of St. Thomas and St. John uh, run on a separate grid system. So there were caps for both of those. Those caps were met uh, back in 2015. And after that, there was no way for uh, local customers to actually install distributed uh, generation and be interconnected into the utility system. Um, so as part of the recovery uh, effort, um, a lot of customers were very interested in installing distributed generation as well as battery storage projects. 
and the government and the utility identified a real need to um, look at a program, a successful program to their net energy metering program. And this had multiple components to it. Um, there was a technical component to it, um, which consisted of doing a complete update to the utilities interconnection standards to align with the latest from IEEE. So they are now in, um, in compliance with IEEE 1547.9. Along with that, uh, we worked with the utility to conduct a hosting capacity analysis on all of their distribution feeders. Uh, and the image from the bottom right corner is just a rep an illustrative picture of the hosting capacity uh, results. So green feeders obviously have a fair amount of capacity left and the feeders that are red are nearing their limit. Um, the picture on the bottom left shows where there is distributed solar already installed on customers, um, either houses or businesses. Um, and these are both the island of St. Croix. Um, so the hosting capacity analysis is allowing the utility to much easier assess interconnection applications when they come in. Um, in the Virgin Islands, um, in addition to having uh, an interconnection agreement with the utility, um, customers are also required to get a permit, an electrical permit for their system from the Department of Planning and Natural Resources. Under the net metering program, those two processes were very separate uh, and there was not um, a lot of coordination between the utility and the permitting authority. Through this new program, um, which is being facilitated through the Territorial Energy Office, um, there is now a streamlined process uh, between the interconnection and permitting procedures, and there's an online permitting portal, so customers now only have to deal with one interface, and that process is, is facilitated on the back end um, through all of those various entities. Um, if you can go to the next slide, please. The next slide, please. Great. So um, we have heard a lot from a number of speakers over um, the course of the webinar today about um, different types of system studies. Um, I, I will talk a little bit um, and from a different perspective about the study that we are currently um, doing with the Virgin Islands Water and Power Authority for the island of St. Croix. Um, so we've talked a lot about the technical aspects of these studies, so I'm not going to go into too much detail about those here. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about our approach to this study um, during the time of, of COVID. Uh, so as part of their recovery, the utility in the Virgin Islands is looking at diversification of their generation. Uh, so in addition to, you know, they are primarily running on um, uh, fossil units that are dual fuel capable, so uh, heavy fuel oil as well as liquid propane gas. Um, so they are um, upgrading their um, generation fleet to smaller, more flexible generators that can then accommodate uh, a higher level of variable renewable energy on their system. So uh, they're looking at installing uh, a significant amount of solar PV as well as battery storage in addition to the solar PV that they already have installed on the island of St. Croix. Um, so in order to support that, uh, we have been working with them uh, to actually uh, conduct a system study so that they can um, best integrate these new technologies 
as part of that, um, we, with one of our national laboratories, the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, had plans to um, have a team go down, work with the, the engineers at the utility to install equipment um, so that we could do uh, significant data collection um, by uh, running a number of transient events. Uh, well, that was put on hold because of COVID um, and the inabil inability of people to travel. So what we were able to do is actually ship the equipment to the utility and through uh, remote connection, um, worked with the engineers to install that equipment. And over the last uh, month, we have been uh, doing a, a number of um, simulated transient events in order to uh, collect data that we can use to um, validate the model of the system um, and help with system integration studies. So we were able to um, trip their existing, take their existing TV system offline, which is about five megawatts. Um, we dropped the uh, desalination plant, which is a reverse osmosis plant. Um, they took uh, one of their uh, generators offline. Uh, and even um, uh, tripped out a distribution feeder. So uh, that work is exciting for us uh, because it demonstrates a, a new way of being able to do and support a lot of the technical analysis that we you know, typically have staff deploy to support. Um, but it's been a, a great success to be able to work with the utility uh, remotely uh, to support these efforts um, and move the, the work with them forward. If you can go to the next slide, please. Great. So I'm going to take it up um, now to a higher level and, and talk a bit about some of the other um, programs that we have going on under the Energy Transitions Initiative, um, uh, programs as well as kind of tools and other resources. And uh, one thing I would like to say before getting into these is that these are all um, publicly available resources. Um, and so I would definitely encourage you all to check out the, our website for the Energy Transitions Initiative so that you can access uh, some of these resources. Uh, so one of the things that we've realized, and I'm sure all of you have experienced this as well, is that a lot of what um, we're doing involves a lot of different stakeholders. Some of these issues are um, facing um, islands either more acutely or in a faster time horizon than they do in you know, larger uh, continental jurisdictions. So one of the things that we um, have done is develop what we call discussion and dialogue papers. So we've identified uh, topics that are high priority uh, for uh, island jurisdictions um, that are also not super straightforward, right? So they really have either different perspectives to them, or um, you know, potentially a lot of different solution sets. And so it can be really difficult uh, for those that are making decisions uh, to parse out information and really kind of understand you know, what, they, what, they, uh, what they should kind of listen to versus not listen to, et cetera, as they're, they're making decisions. And so, um, we have two discussion and dialogue papers that are under development right now. Um, one on high penetration renewables on island and remote grids, and the second on energy burden. Um, and so the papers are, are drafted in order to then support facilitated conversations in jurisdictions with the various stakeholders that do have interest you know, or um, 
decision-making authority over some of those topics. Um, one of our earlier uh, papers was around net metering policy at a time when, uh, you know, a, a lot of islands were looking at net metering programs, um, but potentially, you know, modeling them after um, the continental jurisdictions. Uh, and in the case of the U.S., really look using U.S. state net metering programs as an example. Um, but the context was different. And so really laying out the issues for consideration uh, that were really specific to islands and remote systems so that they could develop a program that really made sense um, for their uh, specific um, context. You can go to the next slide, please. Um, so, I'm excited to talk Jennifer, about... Jennifer, just to uh, interrupt you, you have probably like two, three minutes for those two slides. That's fine. Thank you. That will be done in... Yep. Um, so, we have two, uh, the, a program, or a tool under development right now called Frontier, a framework for overcoming natural threats, threats to islanded energy resilience. Um, as we've been discussing throughout, um, resilience is now kind of front and center, um, but when you have limited investment resources, it can be challenging to understand, you know, which investments um, kind of are gonna provide the most resilience benefits. And so we are working um, directly with Guam and with a utility in Alaska in developing uh, this uh, resilience investment tool. Um, please go to the next slide. Um, we are also working on um, energy resilient critical infrastructure planning support. Uh, this is uh, a uh, follow on to a microgrid planning program that ETI has been running since 2013. Uh, so it's been, it's, it has evolved to have a higher focus on critical uh, infrastructure resilience. Uh, through an energy lens. And so there's training materials. We also have um, planning tools, support, et cetera. Uh, and this is work that we are actively doing in both Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands right now in support of their recovery. Um, can you go to the next slide, please? Uh, and the last thing I'd like to talk about is we just launched over the summer the Energy Transitions Initiative Partnership Project. Uh, the premise behind this was to um, partner with external organizations uh, so that we could extend the reach of um, and the use of the, the tools and resources developed through ETI to a much broader set of jurisdictions. So uh, over the summer, we ran a competitive um, call for applications to bring in partner organizations. Those are listed here on this slide. Uh, we are about to release uh, a call for communities, so uh, communities can apply directly to the program to receive technical assistance from the Department of Energy, these partner organizations, and a subset of our national laboratories. Um, we have a number of other tools and programs. I just wanted to give a, a flavor of them here. Uh, and if you go to the next slide, that. That is it. Uh, so I would like to thank you uh, and appreciate being part of the webinar today and look forward to questions. Thank you, Jennifer, for walking us through the initiative and seeing DOE's impressive amount of work across the US, its territories and international island partners. Thank you very much. And now let me, uh, let me move now to our next presentation from Laura Casado. Irina's expert on grid integration studies, who will share with you key practical insights from the technical grid assessment studies from Antigua and from Dominican Republic. Flo uh, Laura, floor is yours. Thank you, Martina, and uh, good morning or good afternoon, everybody, depending on where you are. And uh, next slide, please. So today I'm just going to present the case studies that Irina has uh, 
just uh, gone through the last uh, years in the Caribbean. And uh, yes, uh, next slide, please. So the first case we would like to discuss today is the grid assessment for Antigua. Uh, Mr. Matias has just uh, said some um, some things about that study, but I would like to remark um, more about that study. So, next slide, please. The uh, techno-economic study grid assessment uh, in Antigua Island was undertaken to aid the government of Antigua and Barbuda to determine the contribution of VRE generation to meet annual demand as well as to reduce the level of diesel generation. The power system of Antigua as of 2011 was predominantly diesel generation, and the study mainly assessed the optimal level of wind and solar generation to meet annual demand. To model the power system, a total of eight scenarios were developed based on the generation expansion plans provided by the country. The technical studies comprise of calculation of power reserve requirements, unit commitment, steady state analysis, frequency stability analysis, contingency analysis, annual generation dispatch, and assessment of the PV assertion capacity. The integration of the projected PV and wind generation according to the generation expansion plan is feasible from a technical perspective, provided that several mitigation measures are implemented. The contribution of the PV and wind to cover annual energy demand reaches 4.2 and 11.8 of the total, thus reducing the share of diesel generation from 100% to approximately 84%, and the curtailment of VRE generation is negligible. The assessment for the PV assertion capacity in Antigua has shown that it is possible to integrate at least 37.5 megawatts of PV generation. Going beyond this number results in increasing levels of PV curtailment. Please, next slide. This is an example of the methodology followed to conduct grid assessment in Antigua and how recommendations have been obtained. In most silos, grid assessment study analyze the absorption of hosting capacity of the system. system. Usually, this is done to reduce the dependency on diesel generation and the main performance criteria considered is the continuous security and stability of the system. The flow chart in the figure shows the steps followed in the grid assessment. After receiving the request for an Antigua and the subsequent affirmative response for Irina, it has started the collection of the data process. As seen in the graph, data and grid elements such as generation, lines, um, solar and wind variability, hourly demand profiles, expansion plans, and the definition of performance criteria are needed in order to select the operation and scenarios based on PV and wind penetration. This a snapshot for a possible situation along the world year that represents four case operational scenarios. Next slide, please. As said before, operational scenarios were chosen which will depict the system at its most vulnerable, such as maximum BRE and peak demand, and maximum BRE and minimum demand. Following this, the required power research, such as frequency regulation research and contingency reserves, are calculating. Consider the variability of PRV power generation. The impact of uh, variable renewable generation is analyzed in each operation scenario on the stability of the system, as well as as line overloading and frequency deviation. If there are issues, Mitigation measures are implemented and the new network configuration is again simulated to assess for further issues. If no more problems exist, the annual generation mix is calculated, consider the variable renewable generation and the demand profiles. As an example, we can see where the analysis provided in the case of Antigua where an increased rate of voltage and frequency deviation was experienced. As Mr. Mastias said, it was recommended that variable renewable generation should have power factor capabilities of minus plus 4.9 
95 protection settings were to be modified according to the working of the other generators, update and redefine spinning research to match the loss of the largest generator. Period generation was required to have full write through capability to contain voltage levels locally and uh, also keep frequency deviation to a minimum. And automatic and decentralized unit commitment and generation dispatch were recommended. To reduce impact on diesel generation curtainment can be performed, especially if the diesel generators are not operating between the required operational levels, especially at low demand. This was the first study that we want to show you today. And then if we move to the next slide, I'm just going to uh, talk about the second study, which is uh, the study of Dominican Republic, which uh, recently we have finished. Uh, please, um, next slide. Okay, and next slide too, please. Okay. The ARENA REMAP study in 2016 shows a potential for 1.7 gigawatt of solar PV and 2.3 gigawatts of wind power, achieving around 43% of renewable shares in the power system of Dominican Republic. The energy mix of Dominican Republic in 2017 was mostly based on conventional generation. The objective of the technical economic study was to assess the possibility of including 25% of variable renewable energy in the power system by 2025. The methodology of the study defines solar and wind generation profiles and forecasts. The collection of historical data was included and the development of 12 F scenarios and sub scenarios was uh, done and also the power system was modeled. The technical studies performed were the plexus analysis, the economic dispatch, the CSU emissions calculation, production cost, frequency, voltage and transient stability analysis, and a minus one contingency analysis. The outcome was that Dominican Republic could be using 34% more of wind and 22% more of solar in 2030, where 63% of instantaneous demands could be covered by variable renewable energy. Also, 45% reduction in CO2 emissions and 60% less production costs using variable renewable energy could be achieved in 2030. Next slide, please. The workflow that we have, uh, that we are now just uh, showing you in this slide, just uh, we want to highlight the link between this project and the different studies. The system was modeled using data such as transmission lines, transformers, generators, enabled, etc., provided by the TCO and the CN utility uh, in the country. The generation profiles for solar and we were procured externally and used along with demand data to model different scenarios of the study. Unit commitment and economic dispatch over a period of one year were optimized using uh, Plexus done by PSDT team in IRENA, which also generated production costs and CO2 emission saving. The study considered different shares of VRE, starting with 70% in 2020 following the Dominican Republic target of 25% in 2025, I was up to 45% in 2030. The power system was uh, created in the Island Power Factory and different technical studies were conducted as said before. Different contingencies and faults were simulated for the different sub-web scenarios selected for study and at a critical snapshot of the system. Critical snapshots were chosen based on PRE generation, demand, power of largest generator, inertia in the system, and a spinning reserve. Next slide, please. So finally, in this slide, we would like to highlight the findings and recommendations that were provided. A comparison of the energy mix in 2018 and the optimal energy, energy, energy mix in 2030 is shown in this slide. In the projected remap 2000 mean demand scenario, studied, the demand could be met by over 900 megawatt of wind, 600 megawatt of solar, 400 megawatt of coal, 200 megawatt of landfill, and 288 megawatt of hydropower generation. The study indicates that Dominican Republic has to address several technical challenges in order to achieve our uh, renewable energy targets and based on the findings, several recommendations were provided. 
such as installation of batteries to provide primary frequency support and to mitigate congestion, grid operation measures, including run units for frequency support, implementation of frequency support in renewable energy generator, install of shunt devices, corrected actions like the connection and disconnection of shunt capacitor bands stack on in areas with voltage issues, reinforcement of the grid by building new lines or virtual lines, a corrected action set at read reconfiguration or regeneration redispatch, change the droop control values for frequency re response, analyze of voltage limits to check the possibility of relaxing those limits to 0 0.9 and 1.1 per unit, ensure limits in continuous mode are in the range 80, 5862 Earth, ensure reactive power capabilities are 0 0.85, 0 0.9 leading lagging power factor, uh, power factor at connection point, ensure PRE generators are connected at points of the grid where delivery of additional generation is feasible and ensure fault right through capability of variable renewable generation, guarantees not in disconnection at voltage site of zero PUs and the connection point for a direction of 150 to 100 milliseconds and reactive current contribution that ensure circuits in the system. So with these results and recommendations, we uh, I'm just finished with uh, my presentation of today. So if you move to the next slide, please. Thank you so much um, for listening to me and just um, just pass the flow to Martina. Thank you, Laura, and a lot for practical for sharing with us the practical steps necessary to be undertaken in such studies and also the outcomes and recommendation. Thank you very much. And now our last speaker is Irina's expert on energy uh, renewable energy technology standards and markets, Mr. Francisco Bochel. The team under his leadership today published a new report, Quality Infrastructure for Smart Mini Grids in Islands, and you are going to be the first one to hear key takeaways from his study. Francisco, over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Martina. Uh, let's move to the next slide, please. So as Martina just introduced, we are launching today a new report from Irina focused on the topic of quality infrastructure for smart mini grids. And this report is also looking very much into mini grids for islands. So many small island territories, the power systems can already be considered either microgrid or mini grid, but even large islands are going more and more into a mini grid adoption due to resiliency aspects. So let's go to the next slide, please. So let me start by giving you a little bit an overview of the market status for renewable mini grids. And renewable mini grids are mini grids that basically uh, use mainly renewable uh, resources to produce uh, electricity. At the moment, the global market, uh, as we can assess in arena, is around 4.2 gigawatts. So it's maybe not so big, but what is interesting is that it's growing relatively uh, rapidly in the recent years. Most of those uh, renewable mini grids are using bioenergy as the main source of energy. And this is because usually these are kind of large mini grids connected to agro-industrial processes, such as, for example, sugar cane using bagasse and so on. So this is the main segment so far in terms of technology but we see significant growth uh, in the other technologies hydropower but mainly uh, solar photovoltaic in terms of geographical distribution most of these uh, mini grids are located in uh, north america and asia pacific around 80 percent of all mini grids are in these two regions so we see a lot of potential still in uh, regions such as africa and latin america to deploy this kind of uh, solutions, especially related to energy access uh, applications. And these mini grids are mainly focused on enabling uh, access to electricity in remote areas, but also in providing electricity to uh, commercial and industrial uh, facilities, also connected uh, with distribution system um, grids for uh, support the utility distribution at community level and even military applications. Next slide, please. 
Now, the, the topic of quality infrastructure is uh, extremely important because uh, what has been seen, and, and Jennifer already touched upon this, this uh, before, uh, with uh, the increased frequency of extreme weather conditions, so, such as hurricanes, for example, is that mini-grid solutions can be a, a perfect solution to increase the resiliency of energy systems in islands. But of course, uh, to increase that resiliency is not only the issue about deploying the mini grids, but it's also an issue of assuring the quality of those mini grids so we can be certain that they will withstand these extreme weather conditions when they have to face those. And again, Jennifer mentioned already the case of Puerto Rico, which is one of the, of the examples that we elaborate in our report. And this case is quite interesting because after the Hurricane Maria in 2017, Puerto Rico really noticed that the main, the, the areas where these mini grids were operating were the ones where it was possible to continue to provide electricity in comparison to other areas where the main grid, uh, let's say, lasted even months to recover. So what they have implemented is maybe uh, an example for many other islands in terms of how quality infrastructure can be implemented in such a case. They include in their new regulation, which was uh, uh, issued in 2018, so after the hurricane, um, the key criteria for uh, mini grids to in, uh, increase their resiliency. And I would like to mention six topics there. They define in the regulation a legal definition of what a mini grid is, including the uh, maximum share of fossil fuels that could uh, participate, which should be less than 25%. The second is that they have clear classifications for mini grids, uh, looking into renewable mini grids, combined heat and power mini grids, and hybrid combined heat and power and renewable mini grids. The third aspect is that they include very clear requirements in, test, in, in relation to the standard certification and testing that they need to uh, follow uh, for in deploying such mini grids. The other is that they refer concretely to a, a specific standards, international standards such as IEC or industry standards such as the IEEE standards. The fifth criteria is that they include the, also the uh, requirements to interconnect uh, such mini grids with the main grid to also increase the resiliency of the main grid of the island. And the last point is that they also, very important, is that they also include clear requirements on how to ensure compliance with these requirements and what would be the penalties for not complying with these uh, quality infrastructure standards. Next slide, please. Uh, so what we see is that uh, the existing uh, min renewal mini grids can increase resiliency, but also we have to prepare ourselves for the mini grids of the future, which will deploy uh, to a great extent digital technologies. And we are seeing that already, including technologies such as uh, blockchain, for example, to facilitate peer-to-peer -peer trading between different users and consumers within the mini grid, um, advanced weather forecast uh, in, uh, using artificial intelligence, collecting a lot of data using Internet of Things, etc. And that will require also strong quality infrastructure in terms, especially of interoperability standards, communication protocols, and another interesting aspect is that we are seeing more and more applications of low voltage direct current standards. Next slide, please. All of these uh, innovations and uh, increase in the uh, quality of these mini grids uh, is resulting in a significant cost reduction in these renewable mini grid solutions. What we see on the chart is the decrease in the uh, levelized cost of electricity from renewable mini grids between 2005 and 2020. More than, uh, it has been more than half the cost. And now, as we can see, renewable mini grids are already in the band of what would cost uh, fossil fuel generation in remote uh, areas and islands, so between uh, 40 to 60 cents per kilowatt hour. And we expect that in the next, uh, actually, uh, 10 to 15 years, that cost may even half again being uh, the most competitive option for such uh, remote areas. Next slide, please. 
So what is needed to actually ensure such a quality is to have the institutional framework to uh, uh, implement that quality infrastructure. And that requires the uh, instruments that are on the screen now. So international standards, but we also need to develop the test laboratories to be able to test again those standards, the certification bodies to be able to certificate that, and then the accreditation bodies, the metrology and the insp inspection institutes. And this is an aspect that has not to be underestimated because um, without all these different elements, it would be very difficult to actually have a quality infrastructure which is fully functional. Most of the island territories already have uh, national standardization bodies and test laboratories. Now the issue is to develop the competency within these uh, bodies to also be able to develop the standards and the testing for uh, renewal mini-grid applications. Next slide, please. Now I would like to mention a couple of, of gaps that we have identified in our uh, analysis in this report. One is that while uh, quality is already assured for the different components of a mini-grid, so for the generator, for the inverter, for the storage, there is no uh, yet really a, a, a um, test uh, approach, let's say, to have a system level approach. So when we integrate all these different components to ensure that they will work together and deliver a good quality uh, service at the end. So this is the first aspect. And the second is the installation and maintenance of these systems. So it doesn't help to have excellent products, excellent hardware, the best PV panel, the best inverters, if our installers go there and maybe install two cables in the wrong way and they provoke a fire. Or the mounting infrastructure for the PV modules is not properly installed and then with a hurricane, everything will, be, uh, um, will disappear. So it's a still a, a gap that we need to reinforce these installation and maintenance aspects in our standards and certifications or licensing for professionals. Next slide, please. I'm mentioning about the innovation aspects. Uh, what you can see here in yellow are the uh, gaps that we have identified in, uh, for the existing mini-grids in terms of communication protocols and also uh, standards for interconnecting mini-grids with the main grid and provide services such as frequency recovery uh, or fast ramping to the main grid. And, and then you can see also the standards that could be applied for those cases. And the ones in green color are the ones that we anticipate will be needed in the future. Especially we think that we will need better standards uh, to apply uh, advanced weather forecast uh, methods using, using artificial intelligence. Also, we need uh, better standards to ensure the use of smart meters uh, in order to optimize mini grids. And the third one is the issues related to cyber security to ensure that there is no uh, breach, let's say, in the security of mini grids. Next slide, please. And finally, it's also extremely important to use these great instruments of quality infrastructure standards testing in our policy and regulatory documents. And in our uh, report, we can also we have also identified concrete examples from different countries on how they have incorporated this quality infrastructure in laws and regulations, the one in, in blue, in uh, directives, the one in green in voluntary standards or in guidelines, the one in light blue and in yellow. Uh, again, we see the case, for example, of Puerto Rico or, or Tanzania highlighted in blue, where already uh, these uh, standards are incorporated in regulations. So this is uh, an excellent practice. But we also see many countries, for example, Indonesia, which has thousands of small islands, which are already incorporating such standards in their uh, national guidelines for uh, uh, mini grids, photovoltaic mini grids mainly. So also a, a good practice that you can find uh, for islands that you can find in our uh, report. Next slide, please. So the report is uh, now uh, available for free download in our publications website. It had a lot of great contributions from partners such as the Alliance for Rural Electrification, the International Electrotechnical Commission, and also from uh, specific experts, including 
colleagues from uh, NREL, maybe uh, Ian Babin is connected to this uh, webinar, I don't know, but big thanks to uh, Ian because he was a great contributor also to this work. And we expect now to start working more closely with uh, island territories to actually uh, support the implementation of these guidelines to ensure the quality and resiliency of mini grid systems in island territories. So if you have any question on this, please feel free to contact us and happy to work together on this very important topic. Thank you so much. Well, that was very insightful, Francisco. Thank you very much for sharing with us the importance of quality infrastructure and innovation in these aspects and all the gaps to be addressed. Thank you. This presentation concluding our presentation part, and now I would like to invite all our speakers, Carlo, Andre, Gayatri, Jennifer, Laura, and Francisco to open their cameras and join me in a very short Q&A session. We hope you can all, I, I'm addressing audience, I hope you can all stay with us for additional 10 minutes because we received a lot of, a lot of good questions from the audience and we decided to ask each speaker one question. So without any delays, uh, let me start with Andre. Um, what is the difficult challenge you face uh, when integrating PVs? Can you share with us any experience and best practices on this aspect? Thank you. Thank you, Martina. Um, well, fortunately for us, we have integrated a 3 megawatt and a 4 megawatt um, system. So it's really our experience now. And um, the major problem we're having is frequency um, deviation. Um, in fact, we had to curtail one of the PV farm because what was happening, you know, in certain days you have high variation of this, the solar systems. You have the under frequency load shedding scheme being operated. So you had feeders coming out. So that was a very serious situation for us. Um, presently, the three megawatt um, plant is not working. So that is good. So you don't have that much variation, only one plant. So that is the major issue we have in the variation. And that is the reason I mentioned, that is the reason why we're going to 11 megawatt oil of our battery for stability purposes, not for storage in the traditional sense. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andre. And now I will turn to Jennifer. If you can elaborate on the availability on the Frontier tool and how can islands access them? Thank you. Sure. Um, so Frontier is still under development, um, but because um, we want it to be used and useful um, by islands and remote communities, we are developing it directly with Guam and um, it's with the Alaska Power and Telephone Company, so it's a smaller utility in Alaska. So we have that remote community aspect built into it as well. Um, so it's not actually available yet. Um, but I will um, make sure to share with Irina colleagues uh, updates as it is developed and becomes available. But uh, all of our tools and resources, if they are um, uh, kind of complete and available, are on our Energy Transitions Initiative website. Thank you very much, Jennifer. And I will have a question for Carlo. Uh, can you please tell us how the Lighthouse Initiative will ensure that it will continue providing support in the post-pandemic world? Thank you. Uh, yes, yeah, sure. So, mm, <clears throat> I guess we will, uh, well, our main point, point of focus will be to continue to strengthen our engagements and partnerships. So, we have signed various MOUs with Caribbean stakeholders, so we will continue to do that. And we will continue to engage with our partners on the ground so that they can address the various issues that arise in engaging in the energy transformation. So uh, that means that we will continue to perform uh, capacity building on numerous energy transformation topics. And finally, we will try and move forward with the implementation of uh, specific indicators to measure the progress of SEEDs across the 12 priority areas of the SEEDs Lighthouse Initiative. And this will be done in order to ensure that we can uh, continuously and accurately monitor their progress and to address the areas where there's most uh, uh, where there's an urgent need to end of intervention. So yeah, I think that yeah, that's probably it. Thank you, Carl. Uh, Gayatri, the next one is for you. Can you please elaborate a little bit on the part of your presentation on grid codes? Why are they necessary? 
So thank you, Martina, for this question. Uh, so grid codes are basically te technical regulations that all active participants or power generating participants in the uh, power system must follow. So uh, it is it is required or mandatory interconnecting rules which the new generators, uh, generators especially VRE, should uh, actually adhere to before getting connected to the system. And uh, they are and and when power markets exist, it becomes even more necessary because there uh, there is revenue involved and there is a lot of um, uh, power you know trading going on and there are uh, so for example if we are talking about some of the uh, support or the ancillary services that uh, VRE generators can offer or any enabler can offer like for example battery uh, the battery can provide frequency regulation it can also offer uh, peak uh, load shaving or many other many other options it can work, uh, work as a virtual power plant so all of these can actually be uh, traded over a power market and because of which there are certain uh, rules and guidelines to which it has to adhere so the same goes for solar pv same goes for wind um, something which is very prominent is the uh, low voltage right through so whenever there is a low voltage issue and it, it this particular constraint actually varies from system to system and the level of low voltage that the system must still con the wind wind or the solar must still continue to uh, function for also varies with from system to system and uh, that is something very mandatorily applicable right now for all like i think mr mathia has already mentioned i think they are already implementing that in uh, antigua so this is uh, i hope this explains uh, the question thank you very much gayatri and now i will turn to laura uh, can you elaborate on what are the technical constraints of microgrids with zero inertia and how can grid stability be ensured in such a situation yeah, thank you. Um, the main issue when we have microgrids and uh, there is the there is the lack of um, energy inertia comes from um, just conventional generation. So that means that there is like frequency stability issues because when you have uh, not so many generation units available, there is a lack of uh, of um, of a possibility of um, just. Um, or counteract the mismatch between the uh, the, the, the frequency des deviation. Uh, the thing is like with the renewable energy and uh, also with the storage, uh, with the storage, you can just um, um, store the surplus of BRE generation to uh, just put on the system when there is like a lack of um, generation. And also there is like the possibility of other, um, other mm, devices such as um, just uh, supercapacitors and um, inner um, and uh, all the other devices that can be enabled that can be used but also uh, there is like uh, you know that uh, when these microgrids uh, they're like they can be just be isolated or also connected to the grid so it just depend on the island and uh, if it's an for like only for a small place in an island that can be just give resilience to the system and also just stability. Thank you very much. And last uh, but not least, uh, Francisco, I will turn to you. It was mentioned a couple of times uh, in today's presentation by Jennifer or you, so I'll ask again, is, there, is Irina looking into the impact of extreme weather events in islands on renewable energy system and how to address that issue? Thank you. Thanks, Martina. Yeah, definitely. That's a very important uh, topic. And actually, we are now working on a, an analysis that will be uh, published uh, in the first quarter of next year on what is the impact of extreme weather conditions, also looking to island territories on PV and wind systems. And uh, particularly, we are looking into the frequency and the uh, impact uh, between the different mitigation options using quality infrastructure and the cost benefit of the different options. So countries and islands may have a portfolio of different mitigation alternatives to address uh, such um, impacts and define their own uh, roadmap depending on their own country conditions. So that's our approach, yeah. Thank you, Francisco. Well, you were very brief, uh, but thank you very much for all your answers. Unfortunately, the time is up. We will go through other questions and we will uh, reply to the, the, the questions from the audience by email. 
uh, thank you very much. And uh, well, dear all distinguished speakers, thank you so much for, for joining us and for your presentation and answering uh, these questions and sharing insights from your work and from your knowledge. Thank you. And to close the event, uh, please uh, let me now invite Mr. Roland Roche, Irina's Innov Innovation and Technology Center. Uh, Deputy Director, who will wrap up and recap all the re insights uh, shared today by our distinguished uh, speakers, where we are and what needs to happen to integrate higher shares of variable in SIT's power grids. Roland, please, the, the floor is yours. Um, yeah, thanks, thanks a lot, Martina. Thanks to everybody who contributed to this very interesting uh, webinar. It's my job now to, to put all this very valuable information nuggets together to one piece. I think this will probably be very difficult because there was very valuable um, information for people that work on energy sector transformations on on islands so i, I would kind of like to reference the the reports we have uh, that uh, you can find under www.irena.org so the the sits island guide for grid integration was more mentioned but also the quality infrastructure um, for smart smart off-grid system is things you should check out on, on our webpage where you can find a very important information. I mm, let's say very happy also with the with the outreach of this webinar. We were able to to reach uh, more than 100 participants in the course of this webinar, which is for such a specific technical webinar, uh, I think a very excellent uh, result. And yeah, try to summarize uh, what was said, is important element um, nuggets here. So islands are doing very well in integrating variable uh, renewables and uh, achieving their renewable energy targets, but they face challenges in achieving high shares of variable renewables uh, beyond uh, 50% of renewables. And uh, there are also challenges in reducing dependency or deep or complete dependency on diesel generation and uh, also to get more independent from price volatility linked with diesel generation. Institutional, social and economic resilience can be promoted through energy resilience. So there is a connection. Tools are being developed that can evaluate the cost effectiveness of different resilience pathways for, of the, for the electricity systems, for islands and utilities, uh, utility staff that can be trained to use this and strengthen the system. So also capacity building is one of the key um, work that IRENA is, is delivering also for small island development states. There is a need for better resource assessment and analyzing the performance of existing generating fleet to include more variable renewables. So understanding the systems and the performance is key for the higher integration of higher shares of variable renewables. There are issues of resilience and challenges of insurance coverage for renewable energy solutions, which calls for solution and, and IRENA is, is, is um, looking into this. Some grid studies that have been provided here as case studied studies highlight that the high shares of variable renewables could be included in island power systems without making huge investments and adopting operational changes and the system still retaining stability and security of our operations. So meaning it is possible to go beyond the current operation of renewables in the existing system without additional in, in investments in just finding uh, and, and, and implementing and operating with smart solutions. Antigua has implemented several measures based on the recommendation provided by IRENA and as they have also been highlighted in the, in the slide that Mr. Matthias Andre um, from um, Antigua and Barbuda uh, presented. The integration of renewable in power systems are supported by IRENA, but also other, other international organization, development partners, 
and also as, as presented here by, by Jennifer de Cesaro from the US Department of Energy. And this has increased in the last years being a, a necessary cooperation between organization development member countries and the small island development states in providing good solutions. My colleague Francisco Boschel has outlined here that mini grids can assure the quality and resilience of power systems, specifically in small islands. And there is a necessary necessity to anticipate quality infrastructure for, for, for future microgrids. Quality infrastructure for microgrids should be, and that is very important, should be an integral part of policy and regulatory instruments to make them perfectly work. And last but not least, also as, as uh, my colleague Carlo mentioned, so IRENA supports small island development states through the conduction of a variety of um, tools and methodologies and also based on our, our experience with quick scans, with support of national department, the, the national um, contributions, uh, enhancement and implementation, grid assessment studies, renewable readiness assessment, and renewable energy and e-mobility roadmaps in going from the power sector uh, integration also to the integration of the end use sector is the very next step also for islands. I would like to, to thank everybody for this um, very successful webinar. Thanks to Andrea, Andre Matthias, Matthias Andre from Antigua and Barbuda. Um, also thanks to Jennifer de Cesaro from the US Department of Energy. Um, a very big thanks to Martina Lyons for the excellent um, moderation of this webinar. Thanks to the, the colleagues uh, from, from the CEP division in, in Abu Dhabi, Arieta Gonovalau, and also Carlos Darace. Thanks to my colleagues in the GRIDS team, Gayatri Nair and Laura Casado. And also special thanks to Francisco Bochel to with this new report on, on um, quality infrastructure for smart grid, which provides a very good um, solution and is very, very important in the context um, of the small island development states. And also thanks to the ICT support and to my colleague, Lijon Gobinathan that helped to deal with the technical aspects of this webinar. Thank you all. And I wish you a nice evening or a nice day ahead. Thanks a lot. Good evening. Thank you, Roland, and thank, thank, you. Roland. thank you. Thank you, thank everyone. You. Thank you. That is all from us. Uh, we will be sharing uh, the link to the recording and presentation in our follow-up email and on our IRENA events website. Once again, thank you for joining us and see you in our next webinar.